Well, good morning. This is uh, Truth Seeker here. Uh, actually, it's uh, afternoon. <laughs> uh, the time has gone by uh, much more rapidly than I expected. Um, I'm waiting for a package uh, to come home. And uh, so I took the day off to wait for the arrival of this package. A lot of things have been going on in my life uh, in the last uh, week or so um, that um, has prevented me from getting in front of the camera. <clears throat> uh, we uh, Last weekend we had our grandson stay over uh, our home for the first time uh, ever. And he's a little over three years old now. He's um, and we didn't know how well it was going to go. Uh, my daughter and her husband, my son-in-law, were planning their um, a little getaway for their fifth wedding anniversary. And uh, we agreed to take our grandson uh, overnight. And uh, we, we made uh, sleeping arrangements where he would sleep with my wife and I would sleep out here on the couch. And uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, Saturday night, or Sunday morning, I guess it was, um, I hear a little voice crying and... and uh, and I heard some rustling and the lights were on in the bedroom. So I woke up and and uh, that night we had had uh, a little pizza party for him because he, he likes pizza and we wanted to treat him uh, to pizza. Well, um, <laughs> over the middle of the night he got sick. I never saw so much throw up in my life it just was everywhere all over the bed and the sheets and everywhere and this all happened at two o'clock in the morning and that poor little boy he kept saying my tummy hurts and he kept throwing up over and over he couldn't keep anything in his stomach for hours and so we we uh, stripped the bed down, and my wife washed the washed the the blanket and the comforter and uh, all the pillowcases, and and we washed him down, and we tried to make him feel better, and but it turned into a disaster <laughs> for our first. Uh, time having our grandson stay overnight with us uh, he wasn't he wasn't uh, upset that his mom and dad weren't there which was good uh, but the poor little fella he just didn't feel well and we talked to him the next day and he said uh, we asked how he felt and he goes my tummy's happy <laughs> I just love the way he expresses himself He's a beautiful little kid, and uh, but anyway, I was in no shape on Sunday. I usually make these videos on Sunday. I was in no shape whatsoever to to make it, and and anyway, my son and son-in-law and my daughter uh, didn't come home uh, until about almost midday, so. We still, we had to take care of a sick little boy until they got home. And uh, it, it it was a sad thing for him, uh, but he's feeling better. We live pretty darn close to where that, I get, what do they call that, a dental virus? Uh, it, uh, the, the one that's, that's killing children. Um, we're only two towns away. And... Uh, I was a little concerned, but it, it turns out to be that that's a respiratory disease. Oop, I got uh, something. I, my package is here. Well, back again. Um, last weekend, I lost my drone. 
and I, I, it's one of my favorite things to do. And so I got myself a new one and hold it up in the mirror. It just came this minute ago, just a minute ago. There we go, it's sort of there. Anyway, I can't wait to open it. <laughs> so I'm happy again. Um, sometimes it's always it, it sometimes it's hard to to pick a subject uh, to talk about, um, and you know this I, I'm I strongly support. Um, any act activist cause that um, is revealing to reveal the the, the weaknesses, uh, fallacies of religion in general. I listen to uh, a lot of Seth Andrews. I recommend Seth Andrews, uh, uh, Amin Ra, uh, Aaron Ra, he likes to call it. Um, um, and, uh, that's the, that's the uh, Egyptian god. Uh, the um, uh, also Matt Dillahunty is another one of my favorites, and uh, I like um, Paul Enns and uh, Ham and Eggs. Uh, although I think uh, it's pretty well established that uh, that there really doesn't have to be much of an argument presented that uh, is rational or reasonable uh, to to uh, debunk uh, Genesis as a uh, as a uh, blow by blow account of creation. Uh, I I don't see how anybody can actually take the Genesis account and 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 um, you know, I, I think a reasonable Christian, if there was a, a reasonable Christian uh, who believed in the Bible, would understand or or at least try to understand Genesis in the context of a metaphor. Uh, but even then, it's a little hard to understand why uh, it, God would um, use that kind of metaphor. It, I think when you look at the, the book of Genesis in the first chapter in particular, in the creative days, uh, the sequences are, are wrong. Uh, even as a metaphor, why would, why would the, the sequence of, um, of uh, the creative events be, be incorrect? You know, that, uh, that, that that the, for no reason uh, it, it would be puzzling um, as to why an infinitely smart being would um, would uh, present um, even a metaphor uh, incorrectly and uh, and and then the 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 whole um, discussion in um, Genesis about uh, sin and uh, and how sin came to be and the and disobedience on the part of Adam and Eve and uh, that, um, that that there's no justice there. I mean, uh, we don't as human beings we would never punish a child um, so harshly uh, for disobedience. I mean. I look at my grandson, uh, and I I love that little guy to pieces. He just is so innocent, and and the world is so new to him. And just to see the the expression on his face uh, when the, the world is right now is all discovery. Everything is new and and good and happy, and um, and he uh, is just a sweet little person. Uh, and he has a, a, a beautiful little personality. And uh, why, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, if he disobeyed me, and he does, he's learning, he's learning uh, that he is himself. And he, um, 
he also knows what he wants and what he doesn't want and sometimes what he wants uh, is not uh, either good for him or something that uh, we tell him that no that he shouldn't do it for example uh, touching um, the computer keys when the computer's on and uh, sometimes he'll hold his finger right above the board waiting for that moment when you tell him no and he's testing his boundaries um, but even if he did disobey um, when I tell him no don't touch the keys I would not punish that little boy w with death or, or harshly, or, or spank him, or uh, maybe we would uh, deprive him of a toy, or maybe a little time out, or something like that. But certainly, I wouldn't take an innocent child uh, and 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 uh, punish severely. I mean, that doesn't reflect very well on on. God's part to say that we we have a God that that was willing to put uh, his children to death and and let's face it any any uh, intelligent creation that was made in the image of God let us make man in our image um, is a child of of that Creator and uh, he either lacks empathy and love. Um, uh, or or um, he's insane. So, you know, the story obviously is made up, and it's made up for a purpose, because religion's purpose is to gain control. Um, that is something that is very primal in our nature. Um, there is a tendency for social creatures to to have a hierarchical structure and there are various ways in which social creatures do you know dominate and some uh, wolves it's the alpha you know they fight and um, but the problem with fighting is that uh, one of your own gets hurt and or, or killed and so that's that's not that's not right and so there there are many many aspects of the bible and the way it presents god um as a being that is just not um is just not a, a loving god yeah, they, he says, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, why would his son even have to die to, to give us salvation? If God is so loving, why, why, why have anybody die? You know, I mean, can't we learn our lesson? And the thing is, you know, let's say from the Jehovah's Witnesses point of view, it's almost God made a mistake uh, in making humanity because he is only going to save a very, very small handful out of billions upon billions upon billions of people that, that lived. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses say only a very relatively small percentage of that of, the, of that number of people are going to live. Why would, why would an intelligent creator do that? You know, that's not, that's not, I mean, when you talk about uh, their belief in Armageddon and the fact that only 8 million or 9 million, how many of them there are uh, going, going to be saved and live into the kingdom, the thousand year kingdom after Armageddon and the rest of the seven and a half billion people on this planet uh, are going to, going to, to oblivion, die forever. And then that's not the end of it. Uh, then after the end of the thousand years, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have another purge, another sifting. And my question is that if after a thousand years of righteous rule, where Jesus rules as a king with the church, with the 144,000, 
uh, for that length of period and and have anybody um, side with evil. Um, the Bible claims that after the thousand years is done, Satan will be released and um, he will go out to deceive the world and uh, many join him in his efforts to destroy God's kingdom. And it says the number of those who are deceived are as, the, as of the sands of the sea. And that's a huge number of people. And you know, again, you get the sense of a tremendous slaughter and, and that uh, there's a relative few who get the privilege of living. And who, who says then that after two purges that God has got them all? Right? If you can't guarantee it with the first purge in Armageddon and a thousand years of righteous rule, uh, that another purge is necessary, uh, who can guarantee then that there a third or a fourth or a fifth uh, it would be necessary and that this goes on uh, forever? Uh, how can people think that this is a, a desirable type of thing to to live and, and experience um, forever I mean uh, Paul says that there's something ages to come and uh, who's who knows what what he meant by that um, but I know what the the Bible students uh, thought about it and I think I, I think I know what watchtower may think about it that there are periods of time in the future after the thousand years are done that there would be distinct periods of work uh, that that God has in mind and who says that additional purges aren't a part of that although the Bible does say that this is the second death and that the and that that uh, God would end death that he says uh, that the the sting of death would would end um, and so, so it, it's suggestive that the second purge at the end of the thousand years is the end of, of um, the end of of the destructive destruction of people who will not live by God's principles. But you know, can you guarantee that? You know, after a thousand years, where he says, "I will write my law in their hearts and their minds." It, it the, the, that doctrine, that teaching, just doesn't make sense to me. That there would be uh, an army of innumerable size that joins Satan and encompasses the camp of the saints, and it's so large that it has to be destroyed by God, and fire comes out from heaven and, and destroys them. So you know, I got I got a lot of problems with. Russell's doctrine um, and Russell's doctrine carries through with the Jehovah's Witnesses and their 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 concepts and their ideas. And also, uh, I have a problem with just Christianity in general. Um, I think that the the Bible the Bible is uh, you know I've been reading. Um, uh, well, when I started questioning in my faith, I started reading uh, uh, people like Bart Ehrman, who indicated uh, how much error has been incorporated into the Bible. And there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that just doesn't make sense. And, you know, there's a plethora of sites, uh, websites, channels, um, YouTube channels, where uh, they go, you know, the people attack the fundamentalist uh, concepts and uh, using uh, logic. Um, and there are a lot of things that just don't make sense about the Bible to me. And that that's, you know, something personal. I mean, many of the arguments, I'm not going to just parrot again <clears throat> many of the arguments that these people make because they make good arguments and, and why... Why restate it? Um, you know, they, they, it just it doesn't, you know, me adding another voice in 
um, trying to prove why Genesis isn't. I've already given some uh, discussion on why Genesis doesn't seem uh, uh, reasonable or feasible to me as a um, as something that's uh, has any remote. Uh, um, is is not even remotely close to the truth toward about how the world was created, how the universe was created. We just know too much. Uh, the universe is just too huge uh, for Genesis to to uh, be um, to corroborate, you know, what we know in science, or or at least even be consistent. But um, I think the things that bother me the, the most are the implications of religion. Um, Lloyd Evans just gave a uh, pretty interesting, um, I, I, I refer to Lloyd a lot because I think Lloyd, for some reason, uh, his thinking resonates with my thinking very closely. Uh, you're a pretty big helicopter out there. Anyway, um, I like I like the way he thinks. Uh, his his um, ration rationale is the kind of rationale that I you know the logic that that resonates with me very very much. So uh, I think he's a very reasonable person. And uh, he made a um, a video uh, recently. Um, regarding uh, what's the difference between a religion and a cult and and ultimately he came out with that there's no no difference i think anybody who uh i got a phone call just a second i have to stop i'm sorry so back again and i voted yesterday and and thank goodness uh, all of these politicians calling the phone every 10 seconds i'm glad i'm glad that uh that's over but um uh, we get a lot of these marketing calls that uh yeah anyway if there's no escaping it you can change your number and they they'll find you again somehow but when i what i was talking about was this uh, video that uh lloyd made regarding what is the difference between a religion and a cult and he had the definitions between uh, what the what the uh, Webster's and uh, various um, dictionaries um, uh, indicate what a cult is and what a what a religion is. And I, I think basically those people that put together the definitions for uh, a um, a dictionary don't necessarily go by researcher or through experience um, because some of the definitions that of a cult didn't really necessarily make sense uh, the the idea uh, that a religion um, the the way they defined religion also was uh, was something that that was um, was uh, curious too. Uh, when once upon a time, just to be Christian was a cult. Uh, when you when you think about um, how it started in Judea um, in the uh, first century uh, A.D., that um, you know you had the the pantheon um it was the the roman pantheon uh was uh probably the the most widespread uh religion in the european world the mediterranean world um and that was derived from the ancient greek uh pantheon uh, the, the romans uh, basically uh adopted the greek uh, religious system and um, carried it on with uh, different names. I mean, Zeus uh, became Jupiter, and um, uh, um, Hera became Juno, and you know, with all of these different gods 
that uh, had Greek names, then were given Roman names, um, and it, yet it, it really is the same pantheon. Um, and uh, it it was the dominant religion in the uh, in the ancient uh, Roman world. Um, I mean, China China had its own um, religious uh, convictions. Uh, Buddhism was uh, was on on the rise, and uh, about the time of uh, Rome and. Um, and Hinduism is an ancient religion, very ancient, probably the oldest of all current religions. And these these uh, religions um, all had a small beginning at one point, and then uh, began to grow. Uh, in the in the Roman world, it took um, about 300 years for. Uh, Christi Christianity to become the dominant religion in the Roman world. Even in uh, Constantine's time, uh, only 10% of the Roman citizens uh, proclaimed to be Christian. So uh, even, uh, even that late in history, Roman history, uh, which was about 320 AD, I think the Council of Nicaea was around 325, um, the the Christian religion uh, was a uh, was the minority religion, and um, yet it played a pivotal role in Roman politics and in Roman history because uh, the Christians were were fanatics and uh, they threatened the the civil stability of Rome. Uh, there, there were riots that were breaking out due to um, doctrinal differences. Uh, the, the, the main difference at the time of Constantine was uh, what they call the Arian heresy. Um, it, it wasn't a, an idea actually created or conceived of by Arius. Arius was just a... Uh, priest. He wasn't even a bishop. Um, he was a priest in Alexandria, and uh, yet he had written a kind of a, a popular little ditty, uh, which uh, spread throughout the empire. Um, that that um, that uh, expressed his ideas of the godhead what what the what the argument was was uh, what the godhead was uh, the the concept of the trinity uh, jesus and god uh, and the and the holy ghost uh, were one and the same and and i think that's really what the the council of nicaea was set to to um, uh, was established by Constantine to to settle. That uh, was the key matter. Uh, although there were other aspects uh, that, that were addressed in the um, in the uh, Council of Nicaea, it was principally uh, to address this. Uh, what what many Christians, uh, especially in Western in the Western Roman world, uh, considered to be heretical, and. So there were riots that were breaking out throughout the empire over these doctrinal differences, and it created an internal instability in the in the Roman Empire, and that's why Constantine uh, called for this council to settle this civil strife. And so what... Um, what the outcome was it was the Nicene Creed, and the Nicene Creed was the basis uh, for the doctrine of the Trinity. It didn't establish the Trinity necessarily in its full sense, but it was the it was the initial it was the initial step taken towards an official doctrine uh, and concept of the Godhead. And uh, Arius was exiled um, along with all the bishops. Um, many prominent Eastern bishops supported the Arian thought, and uh, 
and uh, they they were banished and um, Constantine thought that he could settle um, the civil um, unrest uh, as a result of having this Nicene Creed. Well, that didn't occur. Uh, these the Arian heresy um, boiled uh, for another seventy five years or so. Just um, riots, uh, bloody riots, would would erupt in different cities throughout the empire, further weakening the the Roman control, the imperial control over over the um, civil aspects of Roman life. And without that in control, it's difficult to maintain your borders, especially when. Uh, people are not willing to die for their country. They hired German mercenaries. And so there were a lot of factors that went into the decline and fall of Rome. But the Christian, uh, the Christian factor was, uh, was a big part of it. But I guess the point that I was trying to make was that the, the Christians initially were a cult. Uh, they were very small, and uh, yet eventually they grew to become the dominant religion. Um, are they harmful today? Uh, they, the, the, you know, this, this, real, you know, mainstream Christianity at the, at, at the Council of Nicaea evolved into the um, Church of Rome, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, and <clears throat> you know, you, you, you've got to. A guy who calls himself the vicar of God and he wears funny clothes and all the, the, the cardinals wear red clothes with funny hats. And, you know, I mean, if I started dressing like a pope or I mean, that's it's weird stuff. I mean, just just I, I think Bill Maher had it right in his movie Religious. And I, I really think that that's a great movie to watch because I think um, it was pivotal in my it just was so reasonable. The, the, the position that Mil, Bill Maher brought out was just so reasonable about all types of religions, all, all Christian religions, uh, and, and many other faiths besides Christianity. And it, as Christopher Hitchens indicates, uh, religion poisons everything. And I, and I think, you know, well, what's the harm in, in uh, Catholicism? You know, there, there are a billion Catholics. And, uh, well, aside from the, the strange the swinging the incense and the transubstantiation and the magical thinking and all that other stuff, um, besides all of that odd belief, magical thinking, um, they also claim that it's it's wrong to wear condoms. And so you have an AIDS epidemic in and, and Africa, and uh, they, they um, actively uh, work against um, against medical efforts to prevent the spread of AIDS. And it, it's rampant and epidemic in, in Africa. And, um, you know, that's not what we need. You know, it's hurting people. It, it's, it's causing untimely deaths. There, there, there's a tremendous number of orphans in Africa as a result of, they call it Slim's disease because uh, people with AIDS, they, they die, you know, emaciated looking. Um, so here you have the, the, the world's largest religion or Christian religion. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's doctrines, it's teachings, um, are harmful to people. Um, and, uh, you know, to defy the Pope is to take your chances in, in roasting in hell. And anyway, when you look at the, Christ the Catholic history, it's, um, 
you have the Spanish Inquisition. You had the endless uh, wars between the Protestants and the and the Catholics, and you had, you know, the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, millions of people dying as a result of of the uh, the, the the Christian cause. You had the Crusades, you know. Uh, you, even in the Crusades, you had Christians killing Christians. You had the you had the sack of Constantinople in one of those Crusades, and and it, uh, the, it and those were Christian people, you know. So uh, even the, what appears to be mainstream Christianity can be harmful. Yes, there may be a few sects here and there where they're open-minded and they're they're um, they're they're more liberal, uh, but in the in the overall sense in the picture, all religion poisons everything. There's there's that's one statement that I can agree with Christopher Hitchens. He he articulated that point so beautifully, and uh, God is not great. Um, I can think of the fundamentalist evangelist Christians here in the United States. Uh, we, there, there must be 75 to 100 million uh, fundamentalist evangelicals in the United States. Um, you, you, the, they bring about, you know, the, the likes of Ken Ham and his Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum and... Um, you have the snake handlers uh, in in uh, the Appalachian Mountains, and you know some of those guys get killed. You know, I mean it that it, it just doesn't make sense. And um, but you know you, that's arguing the absurd, and any reasonable person is is going to see right through that stuff. It it may seem uh, it may seem obvious and um, and that uh, that they're you know that these people are are you know off base, but they they can cause harm. And and the way I, I look at it is that many of these evangelicals have been exploited by, let's say, the conservative political. It, it ends up being a political thing. You, the, as much as our government is based in the separation of church and state, religion plays a huge role in our politics because... The the churches uh, have an agenda. Um, the Republican Party has an agenda, and they exploit um, the Christian contingency uh, to to see that their agenda is is accomplished. Um, and the funny thing is that I've never been able to understand is that. Um, the Republican agenda is is an agenda that that makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. It, the policies that they that they have um, create a great you know a greater gap and lesser opportunities for individuals. And uh, and it doesn't seem to me that it's in the best interest of the fundamentalist Christian who really isn't, you know, there are a hundred million of them, but there aren't a hundred million billionaires or millionaires in, in that, in that group, um, that demographic. And, and so, you know, they, they, the Republican party becomes attractive to them, um, using the second amendment because that's something that you know everybody can have a gun and you you feel powerful if you have a gun and so uh don't take my right away to have a gun um and 
you know, I, I, I don't think that's what the Second Amendment was really, I don't think a lot of people really understand what the Second Amendment was all about. You see, at the time that the Founding Fathers uh, first uh, established uh, our government in our country, um, th there wasn't much trust in government, and it was too easy for individuals to, to seize power. And so this was thought of as a way of protecting uh, the the the, the, the individual rights of people uh, and to maintain their freedoms. But back in 1789, when these ideas were first conceived and the, the Bill of Rights was first uh, amended to the Constitution, um, the, the government's army uh, were all equipped with uh, muzzle-loading, single-shot rifles, um, just like the average Joe. You know, it was they didn't have this this complexity of you know of of weapons. They couldn't foresee how you know what an AK-47 or a tank or a, 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 you know. The, the the types of weapons that the that the government has today are mind-boggling. These smart bombs and these uh, cruise missiles and stealth ships and stealth planes and and what's a what's a revolver going to do if a military was going to take over the government? There's Second Amendment isn't going to protect our rights uh, because uh, we couldn't come anywhere close to matching the government's firepower. So it just doesn't make sense. Well, there are other things about the Republican agenda that that um, are concerning. Uh, and one is uh, climate change. And I am an environmental engineer. I've been an environmental engineer for many years. And... Um, the, the Christian agenda, and this includes um, Watchtower and others, other religions, the, the, the thing that bothers me the most about Christian thought and Christian ideas is that this world is a throwaway world. That, you know, the mainstream Christianity believes everybody good is going to heaven and everybody bad is going to go to hell. And and that the earth is just a, um, a testing grounds where this, this sifting is going to take place and that... Um, that it was never really intended to to be a, um, a residence for uh, human beings for forever, uh, and so they think of the earth as a, a throwaway, um, dispensable item, and uh, and and the Republican uh, agenda is that that it's too costly to to uh, put measures into place um, to reduce carbon emissions, to reduce the types of emissions that, um, that, uh, that contribute to global warming. Now, the, how they go about this uh, fight against uh, global warming, um, and, and, and this is a, you know, a Christianity in general, and this is true of Bible students as well as Watchtower and, and all fundamentalist Christians, uh, they fight against uh, evolution. Now, I'm not going to speak about evolution. There are many, many web uh, channels, um, YouTube channels that, uh, like Aaron Ra, who do a, f a fantastic job on addressing um, evolution. Um, but um, the, I'm making a video, honey, and um, so th this. Um, this this is a topic that you know I uh, I I don't have a depth of of um, I mean I've read enough about it I've had some biology I've I've I understand the concepts of uh, evolution but I'm not 
I'm not uh, the person who's going to, to argue the science of evolution. I'm not, um, I'm not uh, as versed as other people in that topic. So while I agree and believe that evolution is the, is, um, the scientific explanation for the diversity of life on the planet and that it's reasonable, um, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time addressing those types of issues. But there are other issues that are also uh, are taken up by the conservative cause and the conservative Christian cause, and one of them is climate change. And climate change, I think, is a very critical, very uh, timely uh, subject that we need to address, and we need to address it soon because... Um, you know, evolution, the, whether it's right or wrong, um, is not going to to cause us as a race of beings living on this planet uh, it, it, to to live or die. I mean, it's 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 good to to um, to know the truth and to to understand the truth about how life came about and how life uh, diversified. Uh, but our lives and the quality of our life is not critical. It doesn't hang on the theory of evolution. Although I am a strong advocate of promoting and understanding evolution correctly climate change on the other hand does it has very uh, strong implications and very strong effects on on our quality of life and could have very dire consequences to our future generations to my grandson to our children uh, who inherit this world after after we do our actions today um, may make or break um, the ability of our our future generations to live on this planet and not only live on this planet but but how to live on this planet the, the quality of their life you know are we going to to deny? Science, uh, because of our Christian agenda, it, it can be very dangerous for us, uh, and it can be da very dangerous to, to our children. Um, I know that, uh, that um, many, many people have criticized uh, the, the idea of whether or not uh, climate change is actually occurring. So, you know, as, a, as a, an environmental engineer, now I'm not a research scientist, uh, but I have worked in this field as a professional uh, for the past uh, 30, 35 years. And uh, I, I understand the issues. I understand the science. I studied the science uh, behind uh, these issues. Uh, I, I work for a company that um, we have to give guidance to our company to, to help uh, steer it in a in a way so that it's not um, uh, utilizing resources uh, that future generations are going to need, and um, and you know the the first thing toward that is to get people to understand that climate change is real, that climate change is not this this fiction, and uh, last weekend. Um, while we were watching my grandson, I found a web page, um, and it was a, uh, on the National Weather Service page. And the National Weather Service is uh, part of uh, the National Atmospheric and Ocean Oceanographic <laughs> Organization. They call it NOAA, um, not the NOAA of the Great Flood, but... Um, uh, NOAA is the organization that tracks uh, climate change, uh, tracks um, uh, studies, uh, researches uh, um, what what's happening uh, globally with our with our climate. 
and they were also the people that that uh, that collect the data from the various cities now when you watch your um, television uh, news uh, you you'll get the weatherman and the weatherman will say um, the forecast for tomorrow is um, partly sunny with a high of 65 degrees and uh, often you'll hear them say the the record high for uh, tomorrow uh, was 99 degrees and it occurred in uh, 1982 or the record cold for tomorrow uh, occurred um, in 1882, you know. So uh, often the records, especially when, when a heat wave occurs, uh, you'll hear the weathermen talk about the record high and the record low. And uh, there is a record high and a record low for every day of the year. And that's being tracked and that that's being tracked for every city in the United States so I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at that that record data mainly because climatologists have indicated that we're not going to see necessarily a smooth uh, transition in global warming but what global warming is going to do uh, is result in highly erratic weather uh, highly variable weather where where you'll see tremendous changes uh, more frequently uh, greater instability in our climate uh, more instability in the storms and the intensity of the storms hurricanes being more frequent and hurricanes being more intense and things like that 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 it climate change is leading to more instability in in the weather and so i thought it would be interesting to take a look at the um at the uh at at these record highs and record lows and i found a website now um at this point i'm going to inject a a screenshot What you see here is a screenshot of the National Weather Service uh, webpage for historical data for any city, uh, just about any city or region in the United States. Uh, on this uh, webpage, you'll, you'll see uh, little tabs, and uh, one of those tabs uh, brings up a map. Uh, an interactive map which uh, allows you to choose a location uh, in the United States and uh, you can zoom in on that lo location and it will bring up a number of weather stations for that region so like uh, if you look at New York City uh, there may be 20 or 30 different weather stations in the southern Connecticut Long Island New Jersey and New York city area and you can choose these weather stations and uh, obtain the data uh, on that on on you know from that weather station and that data is uh, usually uh, just uh, uh, either a PDF data or or uh, text data what they call ASCII data um, text data but you can copy it and paste it into uh, an Excel spreadsheet and that's exactly what I did and I went to uh, I believe it's 16 different cities and I found um, for every day of the year I obtained the record high for every single day of every month uh, of the year and the record low for every single day of the year and also associated with the record high and the record low was the date uh, the exact date and year at which that um, record temperature uh, occurred so 
uh, if there is a record high on May 31st, uh, they provide the year that record high took place. And, uh, and what I did was I obtained a list of all of the record highs and record lows, and I ranked the, these record highs according to year. And much of the databases uh, begin in the 1870s. So many of the bigger cities, um, you can get weather data as far back as the 1870s. Uh, so you, you can find uh, roughly 15 decades worth of data. Um, which is a substantial amount of data, but uh, when you stop and you think about, um, you know, the, the history of uh, the Earth, um, we're looking at a, um, a relatively short period of time, but we didn't, uh, we didn't keep uh, weather records um, until the, uh, after the Civil War. Um, there's some places where you can find some older data, but uh, for the most part, uh, records uh, begin in the 1870s. And so when we talk about the record high for a given day, it's the record high that we've recorded from the earliest time we began recording temperatures to the present time. It's not necessarily the hottest that it ever went because we, we don't have thousands of years worth of data. But at least we have 150 years or so of data. And what I did um, was, I'll, I'll, um, what I'll do is I'll bring up the, the, the kind of data that you can find from these tabs. And this is, uh, this is the way the data is presented uh, when you, when you um, when you find the city and, uh, and, and obtain the table of data that, that provides the record highs and lows. Now what you're looking at is the way the data comes up. And as you notice, uh, this is from the uh, NOAA, the NOAA. And uh, it's hard for me to read the particular city that I have up here, but you can see, I think it's Pittsburgh, PA. Uh, the data set uh, I obtained from Pittsburgh went back to 1874 to the present time. And uh, you can see that all the, all the months are represented and every day. And so what we have are the record highs and the, uh, the record lows and the year uh, which uh, they they occurred, and that's the data that I take. I um, copy it all. I use my cursor, uh, collect the data, uh, copy it, and then I paste it into a, an Excel spreadsheet. And in the Excel spreadsheet, I wrote a little macro that organizes the data. Uh, in such a way that it's presented in a column vertically in order of a month uh, through the year. And uh, what I'm then able to do is use the sort feature to sort the data by year. So uh, the data then is sorted so that the earliest data appears at the top of the uh, data column, and the most frequent or most recent data is uh, listed at the bottom of the uh, the column. And as you would expect, there are 366 um, uh, lines of data uh, in the column uh, for each day of the year. Uh, 366 because they also add February 29th to the data set. So once I get that data uh, organized and ranked, I begin to count uh, the number of record highs within a given date range. 
So between 1879, 1870 and 1879, that decade, I count the number of record highs. And between 1880 and 1889, I do the same. And 1890 to 1899, 1900 to 1909. And for each decade, I do that up until the present time. Now, of course, unfortunately, we're one year shy of a decade from 2010 uh, to um, 2019. So I use a little extrapolation method to try and account for the missing data uh, for next year. But um, after the end of next year, we'll have exactly 15 decades, exactly 150 years. And um, I won't have to extrapolate. I'll have real data in hand. But uh, the, the extrapolation, you know, for, for the, the next 12 months uh, usually only means adding uh, a couple of um, additional days to the, to the frequency data. And uh, what I did was then I plotted the frequency data. Um, and as, as it turns out, uh, they're, they're, the frequency at which um, we have record high days um, has increased substantially over the, the 150 year period. So for the first decade, uh, 1870 to 1879, uh, there in, in that 10 years, there may have only been five days uh, in which a record high was set. Uh, but correspondingly, uh, there in that same decade, there may have been 50 to 70 days uh, where, where record-setting cold occurred. See, back then, that was the end of the what they called the Little Ice Age. And so uh, record-setting record lows were more, much more frequent back in the, in the uh, 19th century uh, than they are now. And uh, it turns out that over the, the last uh, two to three decades, from the 1990s to the present decade, um, we see a tremendous increase in the frequency of record highs. And um, in fact, uh, I, uh, some cities uh, have had as many as 70 record-setting days, uh, record-high-setting days over the last 10 years, 2010 to the present time. And so what I did was I took the ratio of the record highs to record lows. In other words, I divided the number of record highs by the number of record lows and plotted them according to each decade. And an amazing chart comes out. And I'm going to show you this chart right at this moment. So bear with me. And this is the chart that results. It is striking. Anybody can see that it is striking. You can see that the resulting ratio of the number of record highs to the record lows back in the early 18, let's say in the early in the record, 1870 to 1879, uh, 1880 to 1889, um, are very small because uh, you have a small number of record-setting hot days divided by a large number of record-setting cold days. And so the, the resulting bar is, uh, is very small. Now notice uh, what, what happens uh, with time. Uh, your eye just catches a, an extraordinary increase um, 
just the looking at the bar chart alone without looking at the curve um, and I'll talk about that curve in a minute uh, just the bar charts um, you you look at this data and again um, I provided a list of the cities that uh, that I used uh, just to make this this chart and they're um, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Washington, D.C. And I, I put the list uh, there on the chart uh, on the left. There are probably uh, 15 or 16 cities uh, that I, that I um, used uh, because the, the, record day, the, the record set goes back into the you know, 1870s. I wanted to, to go back as far as I could. It's, it's not so useful when the records only go back into the 1960s. So uh, the bigger cities have these uh, older records and uh, they, they keep the records up to the present time. And so um, I'm, I'm continuing to add to this uh, chart. Uh, but uh, interestingly, um, when I use a best fit curve through the data points, um, I get this exponential curve, a beautiful exponential curve. And it's represented by that little formula up there on the, on the right. Uh, Underneath the title, it's uh, on the on the lower right side of the title. Um, you'll see it says y equals 0 0.1. I can't read that very well because this is kind of small, but it's an exponential function, and you can see that this is increasing exponentially. And uh, we have seen since the uh, 19th century, a two order of magnitude increase in the frequency, uh, the ratio of uh, record highs to record lows. And what that means is that that's a very alarming, very alarming situation because what that's uh, stating is that we're, we're practically not seeing any, any years where record lows uh, are occurring, and um, we're we're seeing almost exclusively record-setting highs, um, and there are many of them. Uh, the last decade, obviously, uh, has by far the the greatest number of record highs to record lows, and um, now if you look at that a little equation, you'll see underneath. Uh, something called R squared. Um, now, R squared is a factor, a statistical factor that tells you how well the data fits the curve. In other words, how is this data truly behaving exponentially? And what it's saying is that there's a 94. Uh, you'll see there that it's a 0 0.9433, which is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal for for raw data that has had no quality control check um, to get that kind of fit um, is is amazing. This is not a a scientifically um, <laughs> it's not like a laboratory setting where the controls are 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 uh, very precisely con um, established and 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 uh, and methods uh, controlled to to obtain the data. Um, this is uh, just using the data that's available on the uh, the NOAA websites, and I'm getting a 94% fit. Uh, this that the that this ratio that this frequency that this that this number of record setting highs is 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 exploding on us at an exponential rate and what that means is that in very few years uh, that that curve is going to go extremely high um, it, it could get to the point where 
uh, we'll have 100 to 200 uh, record-setting days in a decade uh, with maybe one or two record-setting lows. I mean, it, it, it is moving very definitely in a um, exponential fashion. Um, global warming is occurring, and it's occurring in a radical uh, way. Um, when you look at the global average uh, for the same period, I think the the uh, the the temperature has gone up about one and a half to two degrees, um, maybe one point eight degrees Celsius uh, as a global average um, during the same period, and that doesn't seem like a lot. A lot of people, well, what, what's one and a half degrees? Well, you can see here. The impact that one and a half degrees has on disturbing and creating an unsettled condition in our weather, uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, weather. Now, th these um, one one thing I will be doing uh, in the future is I'm going to take a look at the uh, the record highs and see uh, if there is a trend of of whether or not there's these record highs are uh, increasing um, in magnitude. In other words, uh, a record-setting high in the 19th century might have been 90 degrees. Um, now it could be 106 degrees, which is a, a substantial change. I mean, when you talk about uh, a comfort index, um, a change from a uh, hundred from ninety to one hundred and six degrees is is huge, and uh, so that that's going to be my next little project. But here, this data is is available to everybody and anybody to look at, and and I, I'm not making this stuff up. You can look at this data for yourself. You can prove it for yourself that this is occurring, and for anybody who's a skeptic, the data is there. They can play with it. They can look at it themselves. There's no way that that global warming is not occurring. And, and people can have that data and prove it to themselves that it is occurring uh, in the same fashion that you can be your own scientist. <laughs> and uh, that's what I love about this is because this is something that... Um, that uh, you can do for yourself. Um, if, if all it takes is a, a little bit of the data and a spreadsheet, and you can you can prove it to yourself that this is occurring. Um, this is what concerns me about religion, because not only do they deny uh, science and, and 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 things like evolution, but they also deny science that's going to have a critical impact on the way we live and the way our, our children live. Uh, the, the implications on weather patterns, you know, um, if, if New York becomes a desert, how do we, we can't move 18 million people just like that to where the, the, the rains are. Uh, if weather and rain patterns shift, um, we could have tremendous, we could be facing a tremendous crisis. Not only um, a crisis in, in you, you, many of you definitely have heard uh, that the coastal regions uh, are being inundated, that the, that the oceans have risen over a foot in the last century, um, and that the many many uh, islands and um, and and in the Pacific, uh, low-lying islands uh, will be submerged in in the next century. Florida, the highest point in Florida is a hundred feet above sea level. Um, most of Florida is only six to seven feet above sea level, and uh, there's enough ice uh, locked up uh, in Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, to raise the the oceans um, hundreds of feet. In fact, uh, we have caves uh, from the last ice age uh, 
that are 400 feet below uh, the current sea level where uh, ancient humans had uh, drawn uh, cave, elaborate cave drawings, and now these caves are under under the sea. And um, and uh, in France, uh, we have the evidence of this. So the seas uh, can fluctuate, and uh, there's enough ice to raise the sea level uh, over a hundred feet, and and that that could have tremendous implications to the major population centers are all around the world. Um, most of our largest cities are port cities, London, New York, Tokyo, Shanghai, uh, or not Shanghai, Singapore, and uh, Sydney, Australia, and all over the globe. The, the, the largest uh, portions of our population centers are, are located around the, the coasts, and uh, they're, they're being inundated. Uh, New Orleans, uh, in the last uh, major hurricane they had, was nearly destroyed. Uh, another hurricane like that, and there's no sense in, in bringing New Orleans back. But it's not only uh, the, the storms and the rising seas, uh, but it's also shifting rain patterns. And you, you can't move large numbers of, of the population uh, if the rain patterns shift. Uh, so that the, the Great Plains become a desert and, and all the rains move north up into Canada. You know, these, it's not like we're going to be able to, to, um, to, to make uh, emerging land uh, productive to, to feed uh, the population if these rain patterns uh, shift. So there, there, there's some major concerns, and and my problem with religion is that it's causing people to close their eyes to real problems. Um, God will fix it, or or you know the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that that man screwed up the earth, but God in the thousand year kingdom will restore the earth to parasitic conditions. Not parasitic, no, that's a parasite. Parad, parad, I wouldn't know how you say it, paradisial, paradise conditions. Um, that's, the, that's what they say, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. And, and in, you know, the next, two decades, we're going to see uh, huge, huge changes in our climate that, that have very, very dire consequences. We have to face these issues now, turning our heads and denying science and denying um, that these things are occurring um, is going to be detrimental to our children. They're going to be paying the price of our sins and God's not there to fix it. We have to fix these problems. We have to grapple with these problems. We're the ones that have to do it. So anyway, I know that this is a little different from what I normally do, but um, I, I just couldn't help uh, but uh, see when, when I saw how dramatic uh, the results of my little project were um, I just couldn't help but but talk about it and and discuss it because religion really does have implications in many different aspects of our life that we don't think about and uh, you know it, it we 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 think about the the child abuse situations and we think about the um uh, the the abuse that that certain uh cults and religions uh um uh, have uh, on their on their members uh, that they that they watchtower splitting families and uh, the Catholic Church is promoting AIDS, and you know the 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 the, 
the, the problems that religion creates are very, very real problems that we have to grapple with. We have to, as a species, we are no longer, we're no longer infants. We are no longer children. We understand, we have the tools called science that tell us what's going on and we can solve many of the problems if we don't deny them and religion is denying the problem and and if we if we are able to get these points through to the to the population in general we have a chance at solving these problems and getting back in harmony with with nature uh, but these are not natural occurrences. These, the, this is a very direct result of anthropogenic um, uh, actions. Uh, the um, I, I did a little correlation between the the, the amount of uh, carbon uh, dioxide in the air. Uh, we're, we're we're pouring uh, billions of tons of carbon dioxide in the into the atmosphere, and it. And uh, right now, carbon dioxide is at the highest levels that we can detect for many thousands of years. Um, we, we know this because of uh, ice cores that we take up in uh, Greenwood, Greenland, uh, that show uh, what the atmosphere conditions were like for hundreds of thousands of years. And... Um, we we've got a real bad situation going here with the with the amount of fossil fuels that we're burning and um we can't be in denial and that's what what the problem with religion is it's burying our heads in the sand and hoping and and putting the problem off into the hands of an imaginary god who's going to fix everything so anyway this is uh Truth Seeker here. I, I hope this has been of some interest. It is something that's very concerning. Um, and if you doubt me, the data's there. Prove it to yourself. It, 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 it's actually fun uh, to try. So um, anyway, um, this is Truth Seeker saying so long, and I'm going to uh, plug in my drone and take it for a little flight. So I hope you all, uh, I wish uh, the best to you all, and, uh, and I, hope, uh, I hope that this has uh, been of some interest to you, uh, because this really does have a strong potential impact on us, especially um, our younger generation. We just can't continue doing what we're doing. We have to take action. And uh, we can't be in denial, and we can't expect God to fix it all. So this is Truth Seeker, wishing you all well, and um, so on.